Welcome, explorers and omniplanetary travelers. Is it hot in here, or is it just a pyronite from heat blast bright planet light star, Pyros? On the world of Pyros, rivers of molten lava cut through the endless fire singed tundra. Who could possibly want to live here? These guys. Pyronites are living, thermodynamic beings that radiate enormous amounts of heat energy. Fierce planetary conditions make it ideal for the locals to spend the days putting the extreme in the phrase extreme sports. But it's not all fun and games to the Pyronites. They're working to perfect their pyrokinetic powers. In the native ecosystem, Pyronites can channel flames in order to generate propulsion, which allows them to surf the scorching hot air. It might look like it's all too hot to handle, but if you ask them, these young Pyronites would likely say, Woohoo! What a blast! Even the warm-blooded need to cool off now and again, especially when things really start to heat up. It's a holiday celebration, Pyronite style. Tradition one, a hot-footed race to the top of Mount Helios, the biggest, baddest volcano on all of Pyros. Tradition two, escape the fiery embrace of the lava dress. So much for thrills, it's time for the chills. Tradition three, Drop the ice egg into the molten core of Pyros. Setting off a chain reaction that cools down the liquid lava landscape, which not only keeps the planet from overheating, but also triggers the party to end all parties. Yowza! Echoplecton, home to the sensational cell splitter Slapback, who's about to cross paths with a fiery favorite. Let's take a closer look, shall we? Behold, a bustling metropolis of a planet, positively teeming with these industrious indigenes, the Echoplectoids. Distinguished by their amoebic ability to subdivide into smaller, denser pairs. Both a biological marvel and a logistical nuisance. Apply that en masse, ad infinitum. Excuse me. Ah. Pardon me. Oh. Oopsie. Sorry. <laughs> And pretty soon, the whole planet's down to standing room only. Good thing this species knows the value of the greater good. Seems these fine fellows have volunteered to leave home and scour the omniverse for the most precious resource they know, space. Looks like their expedition's gonna be a bit more crowded than expected. <laughs> Not again. Ah. Ooh, and bumpier to boot. With their ship overloaded, the Echoplectoids must set down on the closest planet, none other than Pyros, smack dab in the middle of their holiday ice egg festival. Party crashers, this is a no bummer zone. We come in peace, we come in peace. We just need a little space. See? Well, so long as you don't mind the heat. Despite initial tensions, these exponential extraterrestrials are fitting right in. Their power is perfectly suited to the Pyronite's love of all things extreme. At least most of the time. Not again! The arrival of a special delegation from Kinet represents the first meeting of these interstellar neighbors. The Kinocelleran ambassadors are met with open flames by the Pyronite leaders. A warm welcome if there ever was one. But diplomacy takes time and patience, which doesn't come easily to such excitable extraterrestrials on both sides. While the elders do the talking, the young Pyronites slip away and hold a crash course on their most prized planetary pastime, locally known as Magma Ball, for the benefit of their younger guests. Think fast, hot stuff! Go, go! The Kinnacellar and Shura are quick on the uptake. Here's hoping the home team can keep up with the novices. Alas, this nimble newbie's a little too hot to trot. I'll take that! Ooh. And a sizzling interception. The Pyronites are turning up the heat. Not even a Kinocelleran can feel that kind of fire. No! Mama! But that doesn't prevent an immediate rematch. Best of three, Tenderfoot! Mm, bring it on, Hotshot! Uh -huh. huh? What? Oops, busted. What will the elders have to say about this? Quite a bit, it seems. Let's say we raise the stakes. And the game's back on. But this time, the teams are mixing it up. 
With Pyronites and Kinocerans playing on both sides, it's a double dose of fast and fiery, swift and spicy. A perfect pass play between teammates and... Goal! Whatever the elders may be doing, the young ones have already mastered interplanetary relations. Follow along, if you can keep up. Because this tour of Accelerate's home world is going to happen lightning fast. Kinocelerans need to be quick because their home planet Kinet is a swirling sphere of bellowing electrical storms. This ambitious Kinoceleran is undertaking a long observed rite of passage. The running of the gauntlet for the rollerballs Kinocelerans wear on their feet. If you think this youngling is fast now, oh, wait until he gets those gliders. The gliders are actually the precious pearls of the Kinet mollusks. But how to get them? Remember what I said about Kinocelerant lightning. Smart Kinocelerant stand back and let Mother Nature do the trick. Success! Once obtained, the gliders allow for speeds of more than 500 miles per hour and the incredible ability to run up walls. It's a win. But watch out for that mollusk right behind you. Don't get caught up by those lightning forks. You should make it home in time for the party. Even though the pace of life for Kinocelerans is fast, they still find time to let off a little steam. Like everything else on their planet, sports are supercharged. And we're not just talking about team spirit. Crackling thunderbolts let the games begin. Is it just me, or do these plays really fly by? The fans certainly enjoy the quick pace. But there's more to victory than just speed. A well-placed shot can also come as a real shock to the system. And that was just the first point. Ah, oh, I don't know how much more excitement I can take. Constantly moving, Kinocelerans used speed to survive their dangerous electrical atmosphere. This led to numerous land speed records that could never be broken by another species. And while they themselves had been unable to match their own speed milestones for centuries, that didn't stop new Kinocelerans from seeking out the record. These dark times were coined the Slow Age by Kinoceleran historians. We've set the bar too high. Ah! Surprisingly, the end of this snail-paced eon drew near with the arrival of the Arburian Pelorota. Known for curling into a ball and rolling at high speeds, these rough and round aliens were no slouches themselves when it came to challenging the laws of physics. Afraid of the imminent invasion of the Arburian Pelorota, oh, this doesn't look good. The Kinocelerans rallied their troops to defend their planet. But no one can keep up with us. Equipped with electric charged spears, the Kinocelerin soldiers were armed and ready to swoop into action. Surround the perimeter! They won't know what hit them! The invaders landed, but were quickly greeted by the entire Kinocelerin army. Surprise! We come in peace with a solution to your Kinocelerin problem, the perfect spheroid. In a monumental offering between worlds, the Arburian Pelorota gifted the Kinocelerans a rapid solution. The speedsters slammed the brakes on their attack and accepted the offer with grace. They jumped into their new spheroids and were off, accelerating faster than ever before. A new record! Woohoo! <laughs> this marked the end of the slowest years on record, and the rest is, well, history. Arburia, home world of Cannonbolt. Life may be a beach on Arburia, but that ideal tropical climate is outside, while the young Arburian Pelorotas are inside all day long. With 12-hour classes of science, math, physics, it's a lot for a young Pelorota to focus on with all that fun and sun just outside. So the second their day is done, Pelorotas are out the door, trading business and books for sea and sand. Although the spherical species is known for their ability to curl into a ball and use their bodies as tools and weapons, their spheroid physiques also make them perfect belly flop divers. Arburian pelorotas can even dive from the stratosphere, damage-free. They don't skydive, they space dive. As fun as it looks, that doesn't mean you should join them, unless you're indestructible. But with big fun comes big dangers, like the Arburian Karkaradon or as the locals know it, the beast with a billion teeth. Infamous around these parts for spoiling many a hard-earned vacation. Not once to give up a good day in the surf, the Pelorotas put a fresh spin on lifeguarding. 
quite literally, it seems. Looks like doing your duty on a Buria can be just as much fun as taking the day off. Unless you're a mega shark, that is. Ouch! The water is safe once again, reminding us that the difference between predator and prey is how you control your role. Nice! Still a few spots left. <laughs> but more than warm weather and sensational swells, summer brings tourists. Make way! Coming through! The Voxasaurians are known throughout the galaxy for their bravery, their brawn, and a certain lack of etiquette. Bro, let's get this party started! Friendly feats of strength soon turn into destruction and devastation. Even if it's on a small scale. Beat it! If you can't share the beach, you can vacate someplace else. Oh yeah? How about we fight for it? Oh, it's on. The Pelorotas are uniquely equipped to withstand your standard slugfest. But there's no getting around that tail. Talk about making a splash. Now that's something both sides can appreciate. After all, what's the use in fighting? When there's fun to be had. <laughs> all right! Just goes to show that even if you're from another planet, <laughs> you can always find a little common ground. Terradino, just in time for a punch-up of prehistorical proportions. Amidst a harsh landscape run by reptilians, we find a venue of sorts. Outsiders enter this terror dome at their own peril, and by invitation only, from the Voxasaurians. Native to Terradino, they cherish nothing more than a test of strength and skill in the arena. Welcome, all species, to the Vaxasaurian Gladiatorial Games! To your left, the Vaxasaurian Champions, Grile, Basher, and Terradino's hero, Claymore! And to our right, let's give a warm welcome to the Apoplexian's very own, Dario! Swiftfoot! And their mightiest champion, Mock! A face-off for the ages. Feline fury meets Mesozoic might. Now that's gotta hurt. Close call, kitty cat. Ooh, that move is an apoplexian classic. It's down to two. One fighter from each side. A sonic strike puts the furball on the back foot. But he's not giving up that easily. It's tooth and nail, tail, and claw. The champ rushes in to finish the fight. The challenger meets him in the middle. And he's down! <laughs> Mark hates losing, but that was one heck of a fight! But the mark of a true champion is his sportsmanship. And even in victory, a host honors his guest. Mark will be back next year! I'll bring the pain, and Apoplexians will be champs! Mark my words! Well, that's enough roughhousing for this stuff. Onward! Petropia, home of Diamond Head's Petrosapien people. It's hard to imagine that something as fragile looking as crystal could be stronger than steel. The Petrosapiens crafted a kingdom of stunning proportions and breathtaking beauty on the surface. For their ancestral cousins, the Subsapiens toiled far below ground in the planet's deep substrata. Spartan and warlike, the Subsapiens long possessed no awareness of the vast world above them. But now they stand poised to break out from under and claim it as their own. These two factions, though similar, are now pitted against each other, locked in a battle, not knowing that both are puppets, part of a larger scheme. A third faction dwelling even deeper within their world, the Anthrosapiens, waiting patiently for the right moment to strike and take everything from their distant cousins. Ooh, scary stuff. With the Petrosapiens and Subsapiens exhausted by an endless civil war, their unseen adversaries, the Anthrosapiens, sprung a surprise sonic attack from the shadowy depths. Shattering the crystalline weaponry of their unsuspecting foes. 
Reluctantly, the Petros and Subs joined forces to survive the greatest threat they'd ever known. They crafted a sonic response of their own. A wondrous war machine. Its crystal prongs absorbing the anthracidian sound and fury, focusing it as one bombastic blast right back at their enemies. It will take the Antros eons to reform. Threats averted. It took eons for the Petro and Subsapiens to return to their former prosperity. As the dormant Antrosapiens were formed in the dark, craggy depths below, the two surface settlers united to rebuild their advanced civilizations crystal by crystal. A truce for all time. Agreed. Stronger than ever before, and now with a vendetta to boot, the Antros were ready to strike from the shadows again. But as they assembled, a new, unknown adversary invaded their homeworld, the ferocious Fulmini. Making full advantage of the civil unrest, the Fulmini invasion took the rebuilding Petropia by surprise and bombarded the vulnerable planet. Much to the annoyance of the Anthrosapiens, the warrior-like cosmic explorer Fulmini looked to plunder the crystalline world in order to replenish their own devastated homeworld. Facing immediate extinction, the three feuding tribes of Petropia did the unthinkable. They set aside their external differences and joined forces. In the name of Petropia, we fight together. As one, they forged a new weapon, the Vox Petropia, a supersonic attack the likes of which the galaxy had never seen. The oral riptide drove the black-hearted Fulmini back into the black hole from which they had emerged. Endless civil war had threatened to tear Petropia apart, but it was an outside threat that ultimately united its citizens and saved their jewel of a planet. With no more wars to be fought, what would the aliens of Petropia do with all their free time? Apoplexia. Where the tiger-like Apoplexians are kings of the jungle. A jungle shindig, that is. Their world's tall trees are superb scratching posts, perfect for climbing up and up. Now that's a cat canopy. The sandy surface below acts as one big litter box, but uh, let's leave that sand trap to your imagination. It's not all catnaps on Apoplexia, though. Using their heightened dexterity, the Apoplexians leap from tree to tree to surprise their friends and family, just for fun. Yes, this civilization is one giant rumble royale. And as the Apoplexians wrestle their way through the day, word of this rocking good time travels at light speed to Petropia. Although civil war has ended here, rebuilding society is a lot of work. I don't know about you, but I need a vacation. And the Petropians set out for some much needed rest and relaxation. Once they arrive on Apoplexia, they realize they're no match for this rumble in the jungle. The Petropians can't keep up with the charismatic and energetic natives. As a last ditch effort to join in on the party, the Petropians create a giant crystal structure and blast energy beams at it to create a nightlight for their gracious hosts. However, it accidentally generates a super laser pointer, sending light refracting across the planet's surface. Ah! What is this light I must chase but can't catch? The party animals scale the trees and eventually the entire planet, but no matter how hard they try, they can never catch the lasers. Oh Don't worry, these cool cats always land on their feet. Well, most of the time. Fulmus, home to Shock Rock. Much like the Fulmini themselves, this is a rocky globe held together by pure energy. Once a strong Spartan society, the cracks started to show, with warlords fighting over energy to hold their kingdoms together. Ultimately, their greed and hunger for individual power tore their world apart. With their planet in pieces, the Fulmini reunited under a common goal. They became conquerors of the cosmos, using wormhole bridges to carry them to unsuspecting nearby systems with adequate resources for them to plunder. Back home, the Fulmini re-energized their drained planet with ill-gotten goods. After centuries of hoarding energy destroyed their homeworld, the Fulmini boarded their mothership, Fulmus II, and began their cosmic conquest. Flanked by a fleet of battleships, Fulmus II became both a planet and an attack ship, capable of obliterating anything in its path. 
as well as deploying Fulminite troops by the thousands. Masters of boots on the ground invasions. Today, the Fulmini set their sights on Koros, home to the Tetramans. The legions anticipate a decisive victory over their feudal foes. But what's this? No beachhead? No battle lines? Impossible! Perimeter is undefended, sir. They must have retreated before we landed. First infantry storming the royal palace now! Can it be the Tetramans aren't even home? A shocking discovery indeed. It turns out there's a difference between deserted and uninhabited. A truth the Fulmini seem to be learning the hard way. Retreat! Retreat! Back to the mothership! As for all those missing locals, why, they're off on an interstellar invasion of their own. A Fulmus, no less. Oh, if only they'd known what we do. I don't know what to tell you, Majesty. The four-armed flotilla flips a Yui, deprived of the glory they crave. Passing the returning Fulmini en route, spaceships in the night. Until the next unsuccessful invasion, onward! Feast your eyes on Forearm's homeworld, Koros, a savage wasteland where only the strong survive. Koros is home to the Tetramans, warriors who pride themselves on their strength. While four formidable arms are their calling card, they certainly don't skip leg day. Tetramans put their undeniable strength to the test inside massive arenas built for gladiatorial games. Female Tetramans are stronger than the males and are viewed as the superior contestants. But Tetramans are not the only tough creatures on Koros. Warriors also face off against beasts of the wild in survival challenges, and these are no ordinary creatures. They've evolved multiple limbs, just like the Tetramans, to endure on this warring world. But it's no problem for the Tetramand Overlordess. Surprise, surprise! She's crowned champion yet again. Life here isn't exactly a walk in the park, which is why Tetramans need the right tool for the right disaster. Forged from the webbing of the very same monsters that are out to get them. These mighty warriors go to great lengths to obtain the raw material, melting it down and reforging it into the Tetramandian War Spear. With plenty of sharp accessories to boot. What better way to test their product than to take on a behemoth or two? The Tetramans have mastered the art of survival. The Tetraman use their multiple appendages to fend off worldly predators and otherworldly invaders. But what happens when they find themselves no match for the Tetraman Queen? Extreme boredom. Luckily, she would soon encounter her greatest threat yet. My Queen, we have unexpected guests. At last, a worthy challenger. The Queen would come to realize her greatest threat was also her most pungent the insectoid Lepidopterans. As the world's mightiest warrior leader, the Tetraman Queen was called upon to drive away the odiferous insects and save her planet from a threat of an epically bad smell. The Queen dramatically dropped from the sky to show them who runs this world. She swings her mighty spears, swatting Lepids away like the nuisances they are. The queen tosses her sword outward, driving back the swarm. <laughs> Dodging the attacks, the leopards prove more agile than they look. Spitting slime, the lepidopterans go on the offensive. <laughs> but their attacks are no match for the greatest warrior in the galaxy. Spinning her spears, the queen creates a shield, blocking their goo gobs. Ah, man, this stinks! Retreat! The Lepidopterans escape unscathed, but the Queen warns the stink flies to never dare return to Koros. The Tetraman Queen stands triumphant, her quest for combat briefly sated by the Lepidopteran invasion, now forever known as Stink Flies. We'd better skedaddle before the Queen gets bored again. Plug your nose as we descend on Stink Flies planet, Lepidoptera. Oh, the smelliest habitable planet in the Milky Way. Its advanced ecosystem allows for numerous stages of the same species to share in its symphony. Life here remains harmonious, 
thanks to the committed effort by each and every creature to make sure all native wildlife continues to thrive. Which sometimes means rounding up the rowdier beasts so they don't hurt the tamer ones. Spitting slime and blowing toxic gas gives the Lepidopterans more than one way to stop a charging stinkworm or two. Or three. But from the ashes of their gargantuan grub rises the light of the larval stink brood. Which, upon hatching, birth more Lepidopterans into the world. The synchronized cycle of life continues, although life there is a bit smellier than most. With countless numbers of young stink brood afoot, it takes an army to feed them. Lepidopter and sky soldiers will go to great lengths to satisfy the younglings' appetites, even if it means risking their own lives. This crew better watch out. A tongue beetle. Their cargo's been nicked. With hungry mouse to feed above, this underground detour costs precious seconds the Lepidopter and elite force can't afford. Darkness gives our brave heroes a chance to shine in the battle for precious resources. Deeper in the lair of the tongue beetle, they come mandible to mandible with the thief itself. These sky soldiers make short work and a fast exit. Consider this pungent package extracted. Lepidopterans rarely leave their peaceful planet, but when they do, their odiferous swarms leave behind a stench that can take eons to flush. At least the cosmic janitor business is booming. But they would soon get a taste of their own bad medicine. When Echoplecton transports ran into debris orbiting Lepidoptera, spores flood the crafts and cause their navigation systems to fail, sending them off course towards the noxious planet. In free fall, the Echoplectons bump into each other, multiplying and downsizing so many times. Oops, not again! They became like tiny flakes of snow that piled up on a mountaintop. Their weight caused the peak to cave in. The Lepidoprans found their grand mountain, Mandibula Mons, dented and covered in strange snow. Bugs to the brim! Worried, the stink flies race to investigate this odd anomaly. But when they drew close, they realized it wasn't snow at all, but the Echoplectons. The curious crew went on the offensive, blasting the Echoplectons with gooey stink bombs. The impact sent the tiny Echoplectons airborne, combining some back into their bigger forms. The Echoplectons didn't appreciate their welcome party and counterattack, crushing the transport. The Lepidopterans weren't amused. Back off, bugs! You're about to get swarmed! The Echoplectons threw their hands up. We come in peace! We just need some space! Luckily, the Lepidopterans had plenty of that. As long as you don't mind the smell! The Echoplectons made themselves at home, and the Lepidopterans weren't upset. In fact, they enjoyed the company. I hope you like your veggies, because we're heading to Flores Verdance, homeworld of Wild Vine. Flores Verdance is a green gem, where the plant-based Florana are wilder than their verdant environment. While many of the inhabitants spend their days in peaceful reflection, taking in the beauty of their forests, other locals favor their wilder sides. Using their green thumbs to poke sleeping giants, they race each other to see who's got the chops to avoid getting the chomps. But this plant bites the hand that feeds, and no matter what language it's in, the phrase remains the same. You kids, stay off my lawn! They might pretend to be excited by reaching the finish line first, but you can bet it's as much a sigh of relief as a victory whoop. Never a dull moment in this jungle chore ride. Take a moment to appreciate the high points of the scenery. Like the ancient Verda world tree that literally breathes life into the ecosystem. As all living things, this natural wonder has a life cycle of its own. Luckily, the Florana are ever watchful of their delicate environment, letting one hand wash the other. They heard mush roars, massive pollen-collecting insectoid creatures, coaxing the temperamental bugs to share their accumulated bounty with the world tree. You see, the Florana understand there's a difference between interfering in the natural order of things and helping it along. Now that's what I call high-stakes gardening. Today we journey to the Andromeda Galaxy and Overflow's home planet Cascaro. The Cascan people dwell beneath the waves of their immense liquid world to avoid the perils of its dangerous surface. 
torrential hurricanes, and a plague of pillaging pirates. These hardened seafarers are on an endless quest for the raw material that constitutes their exoskeleton armor, serpent glass, pilfered from the deadly, dangerous, delicate spires that dot their oceanic horizon. And while it may seem that their biggest challenge is this lengthy leviathan lurking in the shadows, the true enemy is other Cascan pirates waiting to abscond with their ill-gotten gains. Their hydrokinetic abilities allow them to use water as weapons. As long as their skills are well honed, the pirate captains of Cascan will remain the masters of their ocean world. The Cascan pirates have been busy, and now they're heavy with gold. What do you do once you amass a ton of the glittering goods? Put it in a piggy bank, of course, and there's no safer stronghold on the Cascan seas. Security at this installation is second to none, but with that much booty, it's bound to attract scallywags out to pirate the pirates, like these ruffians. They don't look like they're here to make a deposit, but it's not so easy to make an early withdrawal around these waters. Silent tentacle sentinels are stationed to keep out the riffraff. And these are no ordinary guards. They're psychic, able to read the thoughts of any creeping criminals. Bad move, bandits. Your number is up. And the cask and gold is safe, for now. Let's be sure to keep our thoughts in something positive, like our next world. Onward! You'll need a brain as big as Grey Matters to cram for this quiz about the DNA banks of his home planet, Galvin Prime. Once regarded as little more than pets, their owners eventually realized that Galvin's Omega Point super intelligence and things rapidly changed. The Galvins became the galaxy's most savvy engineers, technicians, and searchers. Nothing could quench their thirst for knowledge and their hunt to catalog all interstellar DNA. The Galvins built an armada of sentient drones. Probing the cosmos, these drones sought out alien civilizations, scientific anomalies, and singularities that only an advanced Galvin mind could comprehend. The immense troves of DNA information they collected from every alien species in the cosmos were uploaded into Galvin Prime's central computer, ensuring that Galvin Prime would forever remain the center of research into the DNA of the universe. A power outage is more than just an inconvenience for the Galvins. Life-changing research happens around the clock here, so these brainiacs can't afford to get caught in a blackout. But the solution isn't always as simple as paying the electric bill. And when you've got pesky isoderic parasites snacking on your power supply, a flawless fail-safe plan is in order. Shoe bugs, shoe! Of course, there's no such thing as a quick fix. Because problems come in all shapes and sizes. That's why the Galvins are always one step ahead. Looks like the lab won't be closing early after all. I've upgraded you to first class for our next tour. Galvin B, home of Upgrade, a galvanic mechamorph. The moon of Galvin Prime is once a barren gray globe devoid of natural life. In an attempt to terraform the moon into its own inhabitable world, the Galvins, led by a great and wise scientist, <clears throat> accidentally crashed with unexpected results. The first galvanic mechamorphs. They spread across the landscape like some techno-organic virus. Mechamorphs possess the ability to merge with and enhance any technology from the inside out. They use this ability to transform the surface of Galvin B, and their entire civilization sprung up practically overnight. There's a legend among Galvins that if their moon was ever destroyed, the Mechamorphs could reform it by merging all of their kind together. I don't know if that's true or not, but I do hope this brief tour of their home has been... Uh, transformational.